Uh, 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 sorry. Okay. Uh, second part. Uh, this part is a little bit uh, more theoretic. Uh, it is div divided in two. First is just an introduction to uh, why we selected Python for this course. Okay. So a very very quick overview. Uh, because the first introduction to Python will be on Thursday. And the second part will be on uh, uh, some kind of hardware and so on, for which we will see how can we interface uh, hardware things from the Raspberry Pi using Python. Okay? So that's why a little bit of Python before. So let's go back at the beginning. You should already have seen this definition, but just to remind us what uh, uh, an ambient intelligence system is. It is a digital environment that proactively but sensibly support people in their daily lives. What that means? It's a system shouldn't be detectable unless we need it. Okay? So we have a need that can be fulfilled by a system, and this system should be smart enough to detect that we have a need and to take actions for supporting us in accomplishing tasks related to the needs, okay? How much smart, how much proactive depends on the system. But the idea is that the system must help. It's not the center, the center is the user, okay? Just to remember, that's what sensibly means, okay? How can we get this really complex system? Because if you try to think of a system that detects what you want and try to help you, it's even difficult between humans. Let's imagine between a machine and a human. Okay, that's the, the main goal, the distant goal. But now, what we can try to do is to uh, put together systems and devices in uh, the environment, in the same environment in which the user lives, and try to make them useful for the user. Um, how can we coordinate uh, those different systems, those different devices together to get something useful by software? Okay, so that's why we are speaking of programming here, because we need to coordinate system together to get something which is more intelligence, more intelligent than just the sum of the single devices. Okay, we want to coordinate them together. And this set of devices should be somewhat interactive, should be able to interact with the user, either upon request, so I'm the user, I'm shaking my hand, and my watch detects the shaking and starts some action, or proactively, my watch starts buzzing because something is happening around, okay? But we need to interact. That's another important feature that we have. And the interaction should be sensible in the sense uh, I don't want to be in this room and I have my hand trembling because my watch is keeping buzzing every time, okay? Because there is something which is wrong. Just once, it's okay. I can detect it. Maybe I can tap the, the watch just to say, okay, I get the notice. Don't bore us anymore, okay? And that's the main motive. Don't bore us as much as possible. Just be present when needed, okay? So interaction, but with some limitation. Okay, then, given this general picture, we need software. Why we need software? Because we want to connect system together and with the user. So we need to build some kind of interface, either haptic, like this watch, or classical graphic user interface, or mobile interface on the phone but an interface between the system and the user. And to do that, we need software. What are the functional requirements of our software, our complex system? Uh, we want to solve problems. We don't care about uh, fancy programming, good algorithms, and so on. We want to solve real issues. We want to facilitate the life of users, okay? So let's keep practical. Let's keep with the eye on the features and not on the general beautiness of the code we are writing. Um, we want to provide some kind of intelligence. So we want to 
try to stay away from classical web GUI interface when you have to click 25 times in 25 different places on the page to get just one single action. Okay, we want to have something which is a little bit more intelligent. Um, we don't want, since we are not uh, skilled, really skilled programmer, at least now, at the end of the course we will be, but since we are not programmer by default, let's say we don't want to be limited somewhat by some language idiosyncrasies. So I don't, I have to remember this exact syntax uh, this is a pointer, this is whatever, this is low level. Let's try to find a way to avoid those low level things and to just concentrate on solving the problem. Okay? And that's why we selected Python, for example. Okay. Why Python? Easy to learn. We will see it's, it is quite compact as a language, so few keywords, fortunately. Uh, quite clear as a structure, no particular uh, constructs and things you don't have to remember, asterisk, point, and whatever, uh, just write the instruction plain. Uh, you don't have to care about braces, uh, uh, semicolons, and so on, because it has a right, uh, very clear and neat structure based on identification. So we don't, the general idea that is that we don't uh, want to be bothered by stupid low-level syntax, but we want to concentrate on the problems. Um, okay, that's it. Then, let's go to Python. Um, very quick. What is Python? Is there anyone here who already knows Python very well? Okay. If it's boring, you can take a break and uh, come back, uh, let's say, in 20 minutes. Okay, just to say, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying now is just something which is really uh, normal and a noun to people already used to Python, just for that. But this is a general introduction. So we selected Python because it, it's easy to learn, and yet it is really powerful. We have extension for doing almost everything with very few lines of code. We can go down to the hardware, as we will see in the next hour, but we can also keep very high level building web service, servers, and so on. Okay, so many levels, all with the same language. And it's really an ideal language for uh, beginners and for starting prototyping things, because it is really compact. I can write a program that speaks whatever I want in 12 lines of code no more than 12 lines, I'm not joking. We will see it in the next lessons, okay? So that, uh, that's uh, why we prefer Python, because we want to get very quick on the problem, okay? Without uh, having to learn for days and days and days and days the programming language. Let's go a little bit back and have a little bit of history about Python about Python. Python first appeared in 1991, so it is a quite low, old language, quite stable. It was designed by Guido van Rossum, and it's a general purpose language. That means that we can do almost everything with that. Um, it's an high-level language, and in the few slides I will recall you what high-level language means. And the main concern of Python is to have a code which is very much readable and very much concise. So very few lines for doing complex things and very easy to read, okay? And you will, you will tell me if it's really easy to read or not in 10 minutes, okay? And if you have any question, just tell me. Okay, going a bit farther back, what's, what is an high-level language? Because I was saying Python is an high-level language. An high-level language, programming language, it's a language which is very much near to the human language, okay? So it is usually short, it is quite expressive. If it's a good language, it can be understood by just reading the code, almost. It should be portable between different machines, between different architectures. So if I write my program on my PC, which is Intel-based, Linux-based, I should be able to port it, for example, on the Pi, which is an ARM-based embedded PC 
based on another kind of Linux. And I should do the same if I work in Windows and so on. So it should be high level. That, that means high level. I can port it. Um, and as I can port it, at least this, at the source code level, this code should be somewhat translated to the machine language at some point. Because, of course, if the machine is different, this little PI, which is there, I will show you uh, in a few minutes, is completely different from this laptop. This is single core, this is quad core, and so on and so on. So the machine is really different. Then we need something to interpret the high level language and to translate it to, to the machine language. OK, so this is an example of high level language. What did you read here? What, what do you think this program does? Prints hello world on the screen. High level, because we can read it. Print, hello world. OK? And the result is that we have something shown on the screen. So a very set, complex set of basic operations done on the machine, which are completely different on a laptop with respect to a Pi, for example. But yet it is very simple. On the other hand, we have so-called also low-level languages, which are near to the machine. In that case, we don't need to translate the language. We just directly write in the language which can be understood by the machine. And of course, it will be different between different machines. OK? As they are very specific for a single machine, they usually are much more efficient, quicker, as a broader term. But they cannot be ported. I write my code for this laptop. It cannot be ported to a different laptop because it's machine dependent. Okay. And since it is machine dependent and it and it is near to the machine code, it's really, really hard to write. Okay? So let's try to have a look at an, at an example who does the same things that the one before. This prints hello world. Okay? But this is low-level language. You see, a really complex with things that cannot be read at all. OK? <coughs> That's the difference. That's why we usually select high-level languages, OK? Because they are readable, and this is not really readable. OK. And what happens to so-called interpreted languages? What are they? They are usually high-level languages. And the interpretation is the process that translates the source code into the machine code. So the print hello word into those set of instructions we had before. Okay? Uh, and the tool that translates the code is named code interpreter. Okay? An interpreted language does the translation line by line. So when you run the program, actually, the interpreter starts and starts reading your source code line by line. And for each line, it generates the corresponding machine code. And then it runs run the code just generated. Okay, So line by line. Compiled languages, instead, adopt a different translation scheme where the translation happens at once, and then we just run machine code. So we start from the source code. We have a code interpreter, as before. But in this, in this case, the code interpreter reads the entire source code, translates the source code in uh, an intermediate code, which is called object code. Then it's then executed by an executor process. Okay, And the first part, translation from the source code to the object code, is done once when we compile the program. And then only execution happens. So we can execute several times without reinterpreting the source code anymore. Until we don't change the source code, of course. Okay? So when we talk about interpreted versus compiled languages, that's the difference. Interpreted, line by line interpretation, more or less. Compiled, read the source code at once, translate it into intermediate code and execute it, OK? 
So what is Python? Python is interpreted. <coughs> so we write the source code, and then there is the Python interpreter that reads the code line by line and executes it. OK? And there are two different ways for using the Python interpreter. One is, is called the interactive mode, when we just write on the console the program and see the effects during the writing. And the other is called the script mode, in which we write the program on a file. And then we ask the Python interpreter to interpret the file as a whole. OK? So for example, let me see if I can. Ah, really tough to see. Let me check if I can zoom. OK. A little bit more readable. OK, so if I write here Python. OK, let's first see which version of Python I have. So Python minus one version have 2.7.8. Remember, in the lab, I was saying 2.7.x, whatever. OK, mine is 0.8. Now, if I want to go in the so-called interactive mode, I just have to type Python. And that's the interpreter. And if I write here the former example, print, oh, sorry, with the H, hello world, OK? The line has been interpreted. OK, this is interactive mode. And just writing the program. And the interpreter is reading the line and executing it. So if I write here 1 plus 1, I got 2. OK? OK, this is interactive. This is really useful when we need to test some instruction on which we are not really sure. We don't remember exactly how it works and so on and so on. Just open the interpreter and try to play with it. OK, script mode. It's the same, but that print hello world instruction is inside a file with the .py extension. OK? So I can do the same here. Let's exit. Oh, where, where I am here? OK. OK, now I am outside. Let me make. OK, I just create a file named hello world.py. OK. And if I, uh, let's do it graphically. OK, I have this editor. I can print inside, which is uh, Trust me, it's really unreadable, but it is much more complex to enlarge the font. So trust me, I just print, type print hello world, OK, and save it, and close. So just to make sure that it's there, I just read the content of the file, OK, print hello world. That's what's inside the file. And if I type Python, hello world.py, I got hello world. OK, the same. The difference is one is, is interactive. It interprets as soon as I type. The other is script mode. It reads the script and interprets each line in the script. OK, we will primarily use the second way, writing the script and let the uh, Interpreter, interpret the script. OK, let me delete the example. Um, close. OK, perfect. 
how can we install Python? Okay, we say, we use Python. I show you a Python, very simple Python program. How can you get it on your PC? Well, if you have a Linux-based PC, you're lucky. It's already there. You don't have to do anything. You already got Python. You know, on almost all Linux PCs. If you don't, you need to install it. <coughs> on Windows, you don't have. You need to install the Python uh, interpreter. Uh, there should be an installer, really simple. On Mac, since Mac is based uh, on Unix, uh, the Python should already be there, but you need to check. Okay? So if you have your PC at home, you can start trying. Do I have Python? Which version? You see, for, uh, for having the Python version, you just have to type Python minus minus version. Okay? Okay, this is the Windows installation. I don't want to, to concentrate too much on this. It was for 2.76, now it will be for 2.78. Basically, you have an installer, you just click on go, 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 finish, almost, <laughs> like everyone do. <laughs> Hopefully, I read what, what the installer asks, just to avoid ending up with Python installed on your root <laughs> or whatever. But Anyway, by just clicking go on and hitting the finish button, you get Python working. And afterwards, you can just open a Windows terminal, which is done, which is pretty much similar to the one I show you in Linux. And to do that, you just have to press the Windows button plus the L letter and type a CMD command, okay? Or if you prefer in the old way, go on start, click on command prompt, and so on and so on. And just type Python minus minus version, and you should see the same, OK? I'm a little bit joking on Windows, but you can use whatever you want, OK? Just to remind you that we are using Linux here, just for that. OK, well, as you have seen, we can develop in Python by just using a simple text editor. I show you a graphic text editor, but I could even edit the text file directly in the terminal, and it works. But it is really, really tough, because I need to remember the syntax. I need to pay, take care of not doing errors. Nobody checks my syntax uh, until I type a Python name of the file, and so on and so on. So it is better usually to adopt what is called uh, an integrated development environment, which is a software that helps us as a programmer to write programs. And usually it has an editor with source code highlighting. That means that the keywords get a different color, the code is correctly identified, and so on. It has some link to the interpreter so that we can just press a button and get the program interpreted and run. It has a, a very important tool, which is a, the debugger. The debugger is a tool that allows us to execute the program line by line and check the errors, okay? So we have some strange behavior. We can inspect each part of our program to detect the error, and this is really, really important. That's why in this course, instead of just using KVWriter, Nano, uh, Vim, or whatever, those really simple, not simple, plain text editor, we use uh, an integrated development environment. And the one we use is PyDev. There are many integrated develop development environment for Python. We selected this one, which is uh, quite easy to use, very well spread over the world. So you get help, you get blogs on this, you get forums. There are quite a lot of documentation. And it is based on Eclipse, which is a quite solid development environment. That's why we selected it. But you can use whatever you want if you don't like it. OK. And you have the links on the slides to download the, uh, the environment and to install it. How can you install it? Um, OK, these are the instructions. I don't read the instructions. You can read it when you try it. <coughs> you just need to care to select the right version for your system, so 60, uh, 32 or 64 bits, depending on your PC. And of course, Linux, Windows, Mac, or whatever you have on your PC. 
Then, okay, let's skip this, which is just installation, okay? This is a screenshot. Let's see something which is more concrete. If I get the mouse, just a second. So I try to show you my development environment. Okay. Okay, this is the development environment. You can almost read nothing there, but don't don't care. Just to to show you the, the aspect of the environment. You have usually a main window here where you can type your code. This is Python. Let me try to maybe I can enlarge the font a bit so that we can appearance, color and fonts. Okay, really text font, let's say. Can you read now? Okay. Okay, this is a simple Python. We will see it in 10 minutes, okay? Don't care about the, the complexity. But this is the editor, okay? So I type here my program. Here, on the left, you will have a tree of your projects, okay? So all the files, all the scripts that you write. Below, you will have basically the console. So instead of just typing Python on the terminal, it runs here inside the development environment, okay? Plus a set of tools that we will see as we go on with the lessons, okay? But the environment is there, it's real, and this is the one we use. Okay, let's keep it down for a moment. Okay. This is a simple and so on. You can try to play it uh, at home. The first one, okay, this is old, sorry. <laughs> it was of last year. So I need to update the Hello World from 2014 to 2015 and type it. What's the difference between left and right? Okay, left is the one that we already tried, okay? So we open a terminal, we just write inside, print, hello world. Right, basically tells to the script, if this is a script which is meant to be run, so it has a main, then execute print. So don't care about the syntax, we will see it later, but you start seeing something which is important in the language, which is a conditional construct. If, if something happens, then do something, okay? And also here, you can detect that this is a high level language because every one of us understands what if means, okay? If condition. Okay. Second example, similar to the one we already tried, we want to sum 13 plus 22. Interactive, let's do it again. Okay. Thirteen plus twenty-two. Okay. The other is the same. Oh, let's me. <coughs> it's the same. In the script mode, checking that the script can run. Nothing more. Okay. So you can try it at home 
type uh, the program as it is there, and it works. Okay? Try it uh, as an exercise. Okay, so last slides on this part. What do you think a program is? So this is not a rhetoric question. It's just for uh, taking some few minutes to think what we do when we program, okay? The first thing to do is that uh, when we program, we are basically describing to the interpreter, to the PC, to the machine, to the embedded PC, a kind of recipe for performing a task. So first, the focus is a task. Second, the task needs some information for being carried. And this information is a set, usually, of inputs, data on, on which to work. That might be 13 plus 22 that we wrote. Okay, so something on the keyboard. But it may also be a button pressure, okay, or a light level, whatever, an input. It usually provides an output, something that happens. My watch that starts vibrating, this is an output, for example. So don't stick on the screen and keyboard. Let's start thinking wider than this. What does else? It performs some computation between the input and external condition to get the output. And this computation may be some math operations, sum, division, multipli multiplication, and whatever. Some conditional ex execution, like the simple if we already see. Okay? So if something happens, do this, otherwise do that else. In that case, we are choosing two different ways, two different options, depending on what happens outside. Okay? And these are conditional statements, basically. Repetition. What means repetition? Do this for 10 times. Okay? I want to make a, a program for doing the countdown. I find 10, 9, 8. This is a repetition. Every time I take the number and subtract 1. Okay? And I repeat it for 10 times. And I got the countdown. Okay? So, main thing that we do in the program. With these very basic things, we can do almost everything. Okay? So what the program does is computing. Taking the inputs, applying some operators, generating the outputs. Something really basic, which repeated and uh, flavored with conditionals and so on and so on, became, be, becomes complex and becomes something that appears to be interactive, for example. But still, it's a set of instruction, very simple instruction. As these instructions are somewhat small and simple, we need a lot of them for making complex things. And this makes the task of programming error prone. So when we program, we do error. Let's assume that this happens. Okay? We may be as skilled as we want, but at some times, we will make an error. That's true. In this case, we need to be able, and that's the really difference between a programmer and uh, someone who just writes code, we need to be able to detect what the error is and to have a method for finding where it is in the code and how to correct it, okay? So there is an error, first question, what kind of error and where it is? There are three main types of errors. Sorry for being a little bit boring on this, but it's really important <laughs> before going over. Syntax error, really, really easy to spot because we use a development environment. We type something wrong, misspelled some keyword. We get a red light, a, a red cross. The interpreter says the program cannot be interpreted because there's a syntax error. Really nice, really easy to solve. We get the line number, we get the type of syntax error, just have to correct it. Okay, so this is the simplest one. Semantic error, this is really tough. We write a program, perfect. It gets interpreted, it runs, it seems to be working good, but it does something different from what we want. 
So I write a program for summing two numbers and I got the difference. The program is working, but it's not doing the work I want. So this is a semantic error, because the program does something which is semantically different, semantic, semantically wrong with respect to what I want. And this is tougher because we need to figure out what, which operation is failing. In my very simple example, the error was that I probably uh, typed minus instead of plus. Okay. But this is really a little bit tougher. The most tough error is the, or the toughest error is the runtime error. So the program works. It works correctly, but sometimes it makes an error, and this error can only be detected by running the program. This is called runtime exception or runtime error. And also here we need to figure out what happens. Okay? So the next step is to do what, what is called debugging. A bug is an error in the program, not a syntax error. Either a semantic or runtime error, okay? And the process of debugging is the, the process of finding and removing the error from the program, okay? So when you hear someone saying, okay, I need to debug the program to get this, means I need to find where the error is and how to correct it, okay? And basically, any one of you know why it's called debugging and bug? No? Okay. Some time ago, uh, computers were not so small. They took entire rooms for uh, computing uh, things really, really simple. Okay, they were really, really big. They were using big circuitry, and it happened that sometime a real bug died in between two different electric connectors making shortcuts. And this caused errors in the program's execution. And the process of solving the errors was running around the whole room for finding the bugs who died in between the, con the connection. And this, from this stems the word debugging, finding the bug. OK? So that's why we call bug and debug. It's not some, some kind of G key terminology, but it's, uh, it comes from something real in the past. OK, any question on this? Scared a bit? No? OK, let's try to get a little bit more scared. Mm. If I can find the mouse. So, nobody's scared. Python is so simple that we are already able to program something. Let's go to the other side. <laughs> okay, uh, let's be honest. I don't pretend you to learn everything from now on in this part, nor uh, you to be an expert of uh, wiring, uh, uh, electronics and so on. This is just for giving you a kind of hint on what you can do with the platforms and tools we are going to use in the course, okay? Then if you need any help uh, or specific information, uh, precise information on, on how to design specific circuits, please ask us without any problem, okay? This is just an example of what you can do. So why hardware? In this course, we mainly uh, face three kinds of hardware. One is the commercial off-the-shelf uh, device, the one that we saw in the lab, in the slides. Okay, so multiple sensor, uh, plugs, and pebble. These are commercial devices. Something uh, that you can buy, you can go on a supermarket and, and ask to the clerk, uh, please give me 100 pebbles, and you get it, almost. Uh, the other kind of devices you may encounter are, let's call it do-it-yourself solution. So something that's not 
available on the commerce. You cannot buy it on a shop, so you need to build it by yourself. Okay. And the third one, which is either one of the two former types, but deserves a little bit of distinction, it's the central gateway, which is something central to uh, an ambient intelligence environment, and usually is the place where the program, where the intelligence runs, okay? So the laptop or the Raspberry Pi or something which has computational power on board, okay? So the plug isn't computational power on board. It's just enough, uh, just the power enough needed uh, for switching on and off and receiving commands, nothing more. You cannot compute uh, uh, the square root or uh, the trajectory to the moon, no. Okay, it's really, really simple. The gateway instead provides the computational power you want. Depends on your design, but it's the place where the computational power resides. That's why I try to make it different between the other two. Even if the gateway is and belongs to one of the two categories, something that you build or something that you buy, okay? But it's, it is a little bit different. So, now in this hardware tutorial, we try to concentrate on the central gateway and on the do-it-yourself solution, for, mainly for one motivation. The central gateway that we study now is the Raspberry Pi, and this is important because it's our reference embedded device in the course, so it's important for us uh, to know exactly what the device can do. So that when you start thinking on the project, you can also evaluate, okay, this is good for the Pi. I can use the Pi. No, I need something more powerful. No, I need something which is less powerful because uh, I just need to receive a Wi-Fi signal and turn off a lamp, okay? Um, the rest, we have the whole course for learning the rest. Okay, so. What does the gateway in general? We said we, it hosts the intelligence because it has power. Not only, it should be able to interface all the rest of the environment, so it needs some kind of connection, either wired or wireless. And it should possibly be able to interface also some hardware device, okay? Uh, if there's, there's a need for internet connectivity, then the gateway should have it. Okay, that's the point for internet connectivity. And if we are doing something by ourselves, that something should be integrated somewhat with the gateway. Okay, so the gateway is the core. Let's try to analyze some candidate. Okay, we use the Raspberry Pi. There are many other solutions. All have advantages and disadvantages. This is a very quick justification for selecting the Pi. These are three possible different platforms that we can use. One is Big Old Black, the other is Arduino, the other is the Pi. What's the difference? Let's, let's start from the right. Arduino is really cheap. We are around seven, ten dollars, seven, ten euros. It's really easy to realize the it yourself solution with Arduino. It's a little bit Let's say it's really difficult to interface commercial devices. Okay. For example, standard Arduino do not have any internet connection. You, do not, you don't have network connection. You need a, something to plug on the Arduino board to get the connection. On the other hand, it is a very low computational power. It can run on batteries and the batteries can last for weeks. So it's really interesting on that side. But it has low connectivity. Okay, we said no network. It has basically just a USB port. All the rest needs to be plugged. Okay? So this is a nice platform for doing do-it-yourself circuits. Not really a nice platform for a gateway, because we said that the gateway must be connected with the rest of the environment, must have internet connection, must be powerful. Okay? So that's why we don't select it Arduino but still we can use it. Big old black. Big old black is a little bit more tough to, the, to discriminate because actually it has a medium cost. This runs around 50 euros, okay? 
five times the Arduino. It is still a really for do it yourself. It has a couple of pins and connectors for doing whatever you want. It's a little bit less easy to interface to commercial devices than the, than the Pi, but easier than the Arduino. It has a really high computational power. More or less, if you have, oh, let me go, just one second. OK, this is a smartphone, a smartphone, OK? Inside the smartphone, there is a CPU which is almost comparable to the one running on the Big Old Black. OK? So the Big Old Black, more or less, has the same power of your smartphone. Quite a lot. OK? You can do almost what you want with your smartphone. It has also good connectivity. So why the hell don't we use Big Old Black? Well, because it costs. OK? So the Pi offers almost the same functionalities, almost, but almost at a half price, $25. And you have still do-it-yourself capability. There are more modules for interfacing commercial devices than on Big Old Black, and this is an advantage. The computational power is still similar to the smartphone, one older smartphone. The, uh, the old Raspberry Pi was having a single core ARM, which is comparable to a three years ago smartphone, an iPhone 4, or less. Um, the latest one is a quad core processor on it, which is comparable to the one latest smartphone. Um, still at $25. And it has good connectivity. It has an Ethernet port on board, four USB in the Raspberry Pi 2, two on the Raspberry Pi 1. Um, you can plug on a Bluetooth dongle, a Wi-Fi dongle, and get Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity, and so on. So that's why we selected, basically, to use the Raspberry Pi, because it's in between low cost, low connectivity, and high cost, high connectivity. It's something which is a good trade-off. Still enough computational power, but a lower cost. OK, this more or less is the draft design of the, of the board. I don't ask you to remember every single component, of course. <laughs> OK, let's see very quickly what are the capabilities. This is just for you to get used to reading technical specification. OK, there will, there will be no question in the exam saying, how many gigabytes of memory has a Raspberry Pi version 2 model type B plus? <laughs> OK? <laughs> Just to know, I got the technical specification. I need to choose if this is the right uh, platform or not. Let's try to read it. Processor. Uh, this is the Raspberry Pi 1. It has the same processor, almost the same processor that was inside the iPhone 3G and Kindle 2. OK? Almost the same. It, it's an ARM 11, 700 megahertz, 32 bits, single core. The new one is quad core, OK? More or less Nexus 5, OK? The, for, the first one is uh, having 512 megabytes of RAM. The new one is one gigabyte. USB. The former one has two USB ports. The new one has four USB ports. Every port can draw up to 500 million pairs. This is really important for doing it yourself, knowing the amount of current that can be drawn from uh, the ports. So the only advice is just avoid trying to load your cell phone, to uh, charge your cell phone from the USB port, because it gets damaged. Not enough for charging the cell phone, OK? just to have a term of, of comparison. Even not enough to run some portable uh, hard disk drive. This limit. If you are running small hard disk drive, uh, 2.5 uh, inches, it works. If you try it uh, with a 3.5, which are a little bit heavier to run, probably the, the port will fail. Where the program is, where the operating system is on, on this board, it 
it stays on an SD card, similar to the one you have uh, in your camera or in your cell phone. Okay, the same support. Any SD card greater than four gigabytes, because more or less the operating system takes two and a half, three gigabytes on the card. Ethernet connection, it has a standard 10, 100 uh, Ethernet connection, and it may connect to a Wi-Fi using a USB dongle, like a normal PC. Other components, part of this platform, you have a, a video output, which is an HDMI, so high resolution output, with 14 different resolutions, and the output can be converted in different formats. It is on board a GPU which performs hardware decoding, so you can play your film on this board. Okay, just to give you an idea of how much powerful it is. Okay. It has also some analog audio output, but this is designed first to drive active speakers. That means you cannot plug an, earf an earphone inside because probably you will damage the circuitry. You need something with high impedance. And secondly, this is not an hi-fi output. So the sound is really a bit creepy, okay? Um, it has some LED on board, and it is powered via USB. So you can take the USB cable of your phone and plug it on the Raspberry Pi and it works, okay? Um, typical rating is five volt, uh, 100, uh, 1,200 milliampers, but it, it consumes much lo uh, less than this. So typically, one board is uh, consuming about three watts. Okay. It could also work uh, by being powered by a USB port in a PC, just to give you an idea how much uh, low is the consumption. But take care because actually it absorbs a little bit more current than the maximum rating of the port. So in longer time, your USB port on the PC might get burned. So don't do that. <laughs> okay, other things it has. For do-it-yourself, there's an header. Let me try to switch, if you can. Does it work? Okay, it doesn't. Okay, might be. Yeah, we got it. Okay. So, this is the Raspberry Pi. Okay, and this header here, here we have this cable, but these are 40 different pins. This is called GPIO header, and enables you to have your do-it-yourself circuit. For example, here we have a, what is called the breadboard. This is a breadboard, the white one, with some electronic components on board, okay? So that's what I said when I, when I was saying the, the hardware is ready for do-it-yourself, because you can already plug things on top of it. Okay, let's go back to the slides, if we can. Moreover, it has two connectors, one for uh, attaching a, a camera, either infrared or not, so you can already embed something for doing computer vision in it, for example, or for taking photos, if you want. It, it is, I think, three, three or five megapixels. I don't remember. Um, and it is also uh, a dedicated port for connecting LCDs. For example, the touch screen that we will have, hopefully, in the lab. Okay, so many ports for doing stuff. Uh, very quick on this, just this is important for, uh, for the circuitry. Power supply, 5 volts, remember, the same of the, 
on the smartphone, no more, otherwise the, uh, the board gets burned, uh, at least 700 million per set power uh, rate. Okay, that, that makes more or less three watt. Um, the SD card, I was saying four gigabytes minimum, possibly eight gigabytes for hosting uh, the, the things you want, uh, not only the operating system. And since the SD card is quite slow as a support, it is advisable to have a class 10 card, which is a little bit higher in cost, but uh, you can imagine that eight gigabyte is eight euro, more or less. Okay, class 10. Uh, the right side, which is the important one, maximum rating. So when you do do-it-yourself solution with this hardware, you need to have in mind that these maximum ratings to avoid getting the board damaged. Okay. Sync current is the electric current that the board can absorb from external circuitry. Every or better. Uh, yeah. Every pin on the GPIO header, so on the header that uh, I, showed, uh, I showed you just a few seconds ago, can absorb a maximum of 16 milliamperes. If you try to, to make it absorb more, it gets damaged. And since the control of the pin is inside the processor, you burn the processor, okay? So you get the, your 25 euros and throw it out of the window, okay? SUS current is the inverse. So the maximum current that the pin can produce towards the outside circuitry. Same rating, 60 milliampere. The lower, the better. Okay, so if we need to control something, we need the circuit that we control should be low assumption, possibly. Um, maximum current that can be drawn on all pins from the 3.3 volt power supply, which is the power supply that goes to the processor, is 40 milliamperes. Very few. Two LEDs. Okay, just to give you an idea. Um, the maximum current that you can draw on 5 volts is uh, almost the same as the one you can draw from a USB port. So 500 milliamperes and can be increased, so you can absorb more, by increasing the power supply. So if you have a power supply which is able to handle more than 1,200 milliampers, you can get more power on 5 volts. So the idea is that if I have something which absorbs power, it should be connected to the 5 volt and not to the 3.3 volts. Okay? Okay. Uh, let me see, yeah. Okay. Uh, very quick on the kind of operating system, then let's go on the other side. <laughs> the rest you can read it. Okay. On this board, basically it runs standard Linux. The official one, the one that we run usually is Raspbian, which is a Debian port. Basically it's a Debian. Another one is Occidentalis, which is made by this Adafruit, which is an electronic uh, supplier. And this has uh, some drivers and components uh, for uh, do-it-yourself circuitry, basically. So it, it has more support for do-it-yourself. Then there is uh, the Arc Linux distribution, which is a normal distribution. Pidora, which is the port of Fedora for PI. And the last two are for transforming the Raspberry Pi in a media center. So there are two distributions that allow you to have a media center running on this mod card. Okay. How to install it, boot, uh, configure, and so on? Up to you. You can read it. You can find documentation on the web. We can look at it in the lab so that we have the board and uh, we can experiment. So do it yourself <laughs> if you want. Okay. Let's uh, go to something a little bit more interesting, um, okay, we still have time, just for one project at least. Okay, let's assume that we have our board. We want to build some circuit because in our solution, 
there is no circuit for doing something. And our circuit, which is a really hard circuit, is to is a LED, is a light, okay? That should be turned on and off. Okay, there are much commercial devices that do this, but we want to try to do the same by ourselves. So, how can we do it? Using the port on the board, the GPIO port. GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output, okay? And using those ports, we want to switch on and off a LED using Python. What we need is, let me show you the board again. Okay, first, the Raspberry Pi, okay? So the board with the GPIO headers. Second, if we are just experimenting a breadboard so that we can plug components on top of that without soldering anything, just using the pins. Then we need a kind of electronic switch that enable us to turn off and on a LED without consuming current, or, or by consuming the less current we can. Because we know we have only 16 million pairs on each port, okay? You remember. So to do this in electronics, there is a specific component, which is the transistor, which is this little black thing here. Let, let me try to zoom a bit. Okay, this thing here. That is a transistor. Something which receives a signal on the base and amplifies, let's say, really, really rough description. If some one of you is an electronic guy, knows that that's a little bit different, but let's think of this as a kind of an amplifier, okay? Um, plus some resistors and one light source, a LED, okay? And what we don't do is to, let me check if I can. Okay, we want to do this. Look at the LED. Turning on and off, okay? Okay, not really fancy, but still everything done using the Pi and the hardware. Let's see how. Okay. Some schematics, just to go back to the, the electronics courses, or go forward. <laughs> For powering a LED, you need to make some current flow to the LED, and this current should be around 10, 20 milliampere. More than 20 milliampere, the LED gets burned. Less than 10 milliampere, the LED is not visible, almost not visible, okay? So in between the two, 10 milliampere is good. We need to drive those current to the LED and control the current flow to the GPIO port. So the, the straightforward, straightforward circuit is to just connect the LED to the pin, the output pin of the Raspberry Pi. How? With the resistor. You see there, that's the value, 330 ohm. If you do the computation, around the LED, usually there are two volts of uh, difference, uh, uh, difference of potential. So 3.3 volts minus 2 volts divided 330 ohm, you get something around 8, mi 8 milliampere. Okay? More or less. Or something more. Not bad. We are a little bit near to the maximum ratings. So that works for only one LED. But if we have to to light one LED for each input port, and there are 40, no hope, okay? We need something that isolates our big absorbing current LED from the port. And this is done using this circuit below, 
here. This is the transistor. Here you have a resistor in the input. And here you still have your resistor plus the LED. But now, here we are connecting first to the 5 volts. And we remember that on the 5 volt we have much more current at our disposal, 500 milliampers instead of just 40. OK? And let's try to very quick. I don't pretend you to remember everything. OK, I'm not pretending this is an electronic course. This is a software, mainly software course. OK, but let's try to do very simple computation. First case, direct GPIO connection, 2 volts around the LED. That means 1.2 volts around the resistor. That, for our case, means 6. 34 milliamperes absorbed. Maximum rating on a pin, 8. We are safe. So we can drive a LED from a pin. But we need to remember that we can use no more than 6 pins. 6 by 6, 36, almost near to the maximum rating, which is 40. OK? If we use a transistor, let's do the same computation. The LED still causes a drop of, all, of almost 2 volts. The transistor works uh, like a switch. When it's on, no resistance, like short circuit. When it's off, open circuit. OK? Let's think it's on, so no voltage, almost no voltage, at the boundary of the transistor. So 5 volts is between the plus and the LED, basically, the, the bottom of the LED. Same computation as before. So we have 5 volts minus 2 volts, 3 volts divided 330 ohm. Now we have nearly 10 milliampere, which we remember was the optimal, let's say, the optimal current on the LED. And let's compute the current absorbed on the GPIO pin. Now, the transistor more or less has this factor of uh, amplification. So current incoming on the base gets amplified by 100, almost, before going between the collector and the meter. Very, very roughly. Okay. That means that if we want to make 900, uh, 9 million pair pass to the transistor, and we have this minimum amplification uh, factor, we can more or less calculate the resistor and say that with 4.7 kilo ohms, 4.7 thousand ohms, we absorb 500, uh, yeah, 574 micro amperes, micro. Okay, so in this case, we can light up to um, nearly 100 lens with the GPIO ports. So that's the difference. That's why we use the transistor. Because no absorption on the, basically on the base, OK? So this is, a, let's say, an electronic control the switch, where the current used to control the switch is really, really low. OK, going back to the board. Oh. Where are the resistor? Where is the? OK, these two resistors are making the 4.7 kilo ohms on the base. This is the transistor. And this resistor below, the one here, is our 330 ohm. OK, this is the circuit, the one we have. Then, OK, let's assume that we are able to do this computation. If you need it, just ask us. Or just read if you want to read it by yourself. Let's try to control the LED via Python. OK. This is a much more complex um, program. But since we are really nice at writing Python, we already are able to write an hello word. We can also try to interpret this. OK. I'm not joking. It's really simple. OK. Uh, don't be scared. <laughs> OK, how can we turn on and off the GPIO port? We need a library. 
we said Python is really compact because we have many modules, many things. OK, this is a, what is called a Python module. And it's a set of functions for doing something. In our case, a set of functions for controlling the pins on the Raspberry Pi. And it is this GPIO here, you see. I'm basically, I'm saying exactly what is written here. Import, so take the module, GPIO from the container RPI, that stands for Raspberry Pi, and name it along the program GPIO. The second is import time. What time does for you? Counts the time. <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> OK. Um, first instruction. GPIO set mod GPIO board. What do you think this instruction does? GPIO is the port. Set mode sets a given mode. GPIO board means board numbering. In other words, from this instruction on, all the pins are numbered from 1 to 40. OK? So if I want to drive the pin 22, I just need to address it by writing 22. In fact, the instruction below is GPIO setup 15 GPIO out. <clears throat> Which configuration is the 15th pin on the GPIO? As an output. OK? <clears throat> Third instruction <clears throat> for i in range 10. Do the same thing 10 times. Repeat. OK? This is an iteration. And what we want to do, we saw that the LED was blinking. So turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off, 10 times. Turn on, GPIO, output, value, 1, pin, 15. That's there. GPIO, output, 15, 1. Turn on. Then we want to wait one second. Sleep, OK? Time, sleep, one. Sleep for one second. Stay there without doing anything. Then we want to turn the LED off. Output, 15, zero. Same pin, this time it's zero. Ground. Sleep another one second. Let's run it another time. Oh, sorry. I need to change the screen. And you see the light blinking. That's the code, nothing more. Okay, so that's why we, I was saying this is a good platform because it's easy to develop new circuits and test them. And and Python is really simple for doing almost everything. You see that? Let's count the lines without comments, without comments, without imports because you know. They are just there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven lines of code for lighting up and lighting off a LED. OK. Any question? A little bit more scared now? No? Very nice. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, so. A little bit more complicated circuit. <clears throat> we want to make a light sensor. Same hardware. Raspberry Pi. You want to detect the light level. <clears throat> and if the light gets low, light up the LED. If the light uh, gets high, shut down the LED. We know how to light up and shut down the LED now, OK? Because we already done it. So what we need is something which is sensible to the light. This something is a component named photoresistor. It's a resistance that changes its value depending on the incident light. Okay? 
Then you see here there are a couple of other components. Because with the pi, we have one problem. We have already a component that changes its value depending on the light. So why not measuring the value? Because it's an analog value. So it's a value that varies. 2 kilo ohms, 2.2 kilo ohms, 2.3, 2.4, and whatever. But the inputs on the Raspberry Pi are digital. 1, 0. No way for measuring something that's different from 1 and 0. So we need a circuit for transforming an analog level to, into 1 and 0. OK? And here we can use a trick. So again, I'm not requiring you to do this. If you want, you can. But this is just to, rem to recall you that sometimes you have to design tricks, design solutions, because the hardware is not the best suited for your things. OK? But still, you want to use it. In our case, the Pi is not best suited for measuring analog values. But we can do it how? By remembering that in electronics or in electric, electrotechnics, there is a circuit which is named the RC circuit, which is a simple filter that has a constant, a time constant, okay, that varies depending on the resistance, okay, and the characteristics in voltage of the RC circuit is a curve like this. When you apply a voltage to an RC circuit, the corresponding voltage on the capacitor starts from zero and then first has a very first part here with a quadratic increase. Then uh, it has some linear increase and then it's uh, going down to the steady value of the incoming voltage. But what we know from theory is that to reach almost the 63% of the maximum value, it takes one time constant, which is the value of the resistance multiplied the value of the capacitance, RC. The logic circuits on board, on the PI, interpret every voltage greater than two volts as one, okay? And every voltage lower the 0 0.7, let's say, is 0. So let's take a, a, a grid approximation and we say that everything behind 2 volts is 0, everything over 2 volts is 1. OK? Now, what can we change? We have a photoresistor, a resistance that changes its value depending on the light. So what we can change is the slope of this part, which might be steep or less steep, depending on the resistor. And this means that the time needed for switching from 0 to 1, or the time needed for reaching 2 volts, changes depending on the resistance, which indeed means changes depending on the light. Okay. So our trick to getting the light level is basically is to measure this time here. OK. So this is the circuit. Resistance. The resistance with the circle outside is the photoresistance. This one particular varies its resistance between 2 and 20 kilo ohm. OK. The lower the resistance, the higher is the light incoming. OK, so no light, almost 20 kilo ohm. All light, 2 kilo ohm. So the total resistance on the capacitor varies from 3 kilo ohm to 21 kilo ohm. OK? And with this capacitor, which is one microfarad, we can compute the time needed for uh, reaching 63% of the voltage, which indeed, we are lucky, over 2 volts. 
So one constant, time constant is the time that we take for switching from 0 to 1. OK. Which in milliseconds means 2 kilo multiplied by 1 microfarad, 2 milliseconds. 21 kilo by 1 microfarad, 21 milliseconds. So our time will change between 2 and 21 milliseconds, roughly. Roughly because the nominal value of the resistor is between 2 and 20, but we will see that it changes a little bit. But it doesn't matter. We know that that's the range between 2 and 21 milliseconds. So what's the algorithm? So what's our, how works our trick? <clears throat> we need to count the time. So we need somewhat to give a, a ramp, give, a, give a, um, five volts suddenly, and measure the time that it takes the circuit to reach the five volts on the output. Okay? And to do that, we first use the GPIO pin as an output, and we put it at zero. So we short circuit, basically, the capacitor. And we bring zero node between the capacitor and the, do, the two resistors. OK? So here. Here, there will be zero volt when we switch the pin at zero. Then we set the input at, as an input. Sorry, we set the pin as an input. In that case, the resistance of the pin is infinite. So this is like an open circuit. That means that we leave the, this RC circuit to load. OK? And it takes one time constant for switching from 0 volt that were here to up of 2 volt, which is one logic. And we measure the time took from the moment in which we turn the pin to input to the moment in which we get 1 on the input. And this time depends on the light. OK, a little bit longer. Let's have a look quick. The same as before, a little bit more stuff in there. But let's concentrate on the functions. So set mode GPIO board means set the numbering. OK? 1 to 40. The same as before. Then we said that we want to count the time between the, the instant in which we turn the pin at input and the instant we get 1. For doing that, we use a function. You will see what a function is in three lessons, so don't be scared about this. We will go back much slower on this. But the function is this RC time. As the name tells, count the time for the RC circuit. Okay? On the pin given. Then, we said the algorithm was turn the pin, the pin at zero so that we short circuit the capacitor. Okay? First step. GPIO setup, pin out. So the pin that we select at output. We turn it at output. Second, I'm just reading because I, I know that uh, at the end of the room it's not readable, but you can look at that uh, on the slide. Um, second, GPIO output, so set the pin as an output, and put it at low, at zero, as we said. Wait, how much? 0.2 seconds. It's sufficient for everything to settle and to get zero in the node between the resistor and the capacitor. Okay? Now that everything is settled down, we got zero, we can start measuring. So let's turn the pin here, GPIO set up, pin, GPIO in. Okay, turn the pin as an input. High impedance, the circuit starts loading, the capacitor increases its charge until everything settles, okay? When the value of the voltage about, uh, around the capacitor rises over 2 volts, we get 1 as input, okay? 
So here we start, just after having turned the pin as an input, we start a counter. Time to time, get the time now, okay? Then, until we read low, we count. Is the pin low? Plus one. Is the pin low? Plus one. And we go over. When the circuit is completely, not completely, 63% loaded, the pin turns from low to high, and the, the cycle stops, and we got a, a value, a number, which is the number of cycles we have done waiting for the pin to become high. 100, 5,000, I don't know. I don't care, actually. We can also compute the time, because just before starting, we stored the start time. We can read the hand time multiplied by 1,000 and get it in milliseconds. OK. This is the time. What can we do with this time? Well, we can try to experiment with light, no light, and fix a threshold for saying, OK, this means light, this means no light. OK? So 1,000 means light. Less than 1,000 means no light, for example. And then this is what it what is done here. While true, that means forever, count the time with the function that we already have seen. And if the value of, of the count is less than 1,000, then we assume that there is light, and we set the output pin for the LED at low, zero. Otherwise, no light, output pin for the LED at one. OK? The same code as before. OK, let's see what happens if it works. OK, this is the code running. Now, the resistance is under the light. OK? And we get a count which is 1,000 and a half, more or less, 1,500. OK? Which is more or less around 14 milliseconds. OK. Let's try to switch, if it works, light off. You see the count now? 4,000. Because the time for the capacitor to load changes depending on the resistor, which changes on the light. And in this case, if we switch to the board, the LED is lit. Look at the LED. He turned it off because the light on the resistance made the time to get uh, a little bit lower, a little bit, three times lower. Okay? That means we passed over the threshold. That in this specific case is 2000. Okay? Not 1000, 2000. And since it's below the threshold, we turn the LED off. OK? Is it clear? Now I see scared and tired faces. <laughs> OK, it's time to close. If you have any question, you feel free to ask now or next lessons. OK? This is on uh, the website. And on GitHub, you find the code. <laughs>